Welcome to Science Cafe Nashua. My name is Dan Marchek. I'm one of the uh, organizers of this event. And I am going to give them a little introduction and then let them introduce themselves. And then we'll throw it open to you for question and answer. So it's pretty, pretty free form. All right, so we'll start at this end. John Aber is uh, sometimes known as the former provost of compost. He was the compost at UNH. He's been a faculty there for over 30 years, so he's, he's one of us now. Uh, he is a professor of environmental sciences at UNH since 1987 and was vice president for research and provost, and he's currently one of four UNH prof uh, university professors at UNH. Uh, Reagan Bissonette is the executive director of Northeast Resource, Resource Recovery Association, and her priority is to advance their mission to partner with mu municipalities to make recycling stronger through economic and environmentally sound solutions. So that sounds pretty practical. Mike Duran is with RMG Enterprise. He's a business development manager of municipal commercial waste and recycling services. And his company has developed and maintains an unparalleled global network to effectively remarket all of your reusable assets. And Lisa Drake, last but not least, is the Director of Sustainability Innovation at Stonyfield Yogurt. And uh, she's been there for 16 years and she's developed and managed Stonyfield's award-winning environmental and energy initiatives. So this is a great panel and we're very proud to have them here. Maybe introduce yourself in a little more depth and then we'll start taking questions. Sure. John Aber, UNH 32 years. Um, as the intro said, I survived eight years in administration to return to real life as a faculty member. Uh, with a break in there that actually uh, allowed me to um, apply for a grant to do uh, research at the First in the Nation, New Hampshire, Organic Dairy Research Farm uh, at the University of New Hampshire, and actually still the only one in the country, which is a story in itself. Many thanks to Stonyfield for their early support and guidance in the uh, development of that farm. One of the projects that we pursued as part of an ecosystem approach to try to close nutrient cycles and energy cycles was an innovative approach to composting. So you think of compost piles as those turnable long windrows, you know, or the things in your backyard. Um, compost is uh, going beyond that. In the last 10 years, there's a process called uh, aerated static pile composting with heat recovery, and the, uh, the facility we have out at the organic dairy actually generates vapor air at 150 degrees, and we can get about a million BTUs a, a day out of this facility uh, composting farm waste. So part of a larger effort at UNH, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about, well, UNH is very proud of its role in sustainability nationwide. We get about 70% of our energy from landfill gas from turnkey landfill in Rochester. Um, and to top it all, I guess the, tops, the top one is that we are one of three universities that have platinum status uh, under the STARS program by the professional association that rates universities. So anyway, I'm looking forward to the discussion here. I uh, hope I can add to it. So thanks for coming out. My name is Reagan Bissonette. I'm the executive director of the Northeast Resource Recovery Association. And we are a nonprofit that enables communities to manage their own recycling programs. Um, and what that means is that um, we actually help communities sell their recyclables by connecting them to the companies that actually want to purchase those recyclable materials. Um, and the city of Nashua is a member of ours. We were actually founded um, about 40 years ago when four municipalities in New Hampshire decided to pool together their resources so that they could get better pricing at market for selling their recyclables uh, with their greater volume and so they could also share information about how to improve their recycling programs. And that really informs what we do today. We have over 400 members throughout New England. Most of those are municipalities but we also have some businesses and individuals nonprofits and governmental agencies that are members of ours. 
and the bulk of our membership is in New Hampshire and Vermont. We were founded in New Hampshire. Um, and the two key aspects of our work is, one, we still offer what's called a cooperative marketing and purchasing program. So we do connect communities to the purchases of their recyclables. Um, and that's very unique. We're one of only a handful of nonprofits in the country that does that kind of work. It's typically done by for-profit companies. So that means that we're very uniquely tuned into what's happening with the recycling markets here in the Northeast. And then the other big piece of what we do is education and technical assistance. So we have monthly meetings for our municipal members to get together um, and, and share their challenges uh, and success stories and to learn about what's happening in the recycling markets. Uh, we have an annual conference each year. And uh, I imagine that um, for those of you who are, are not already residents of Nashua, many of your communities are likely members of ours. So very happy to be here to talk about recycling and solid waste and what's happening specifically in New Hampshire and how communities are being impacted. Uh, my name is Mike Doran. I'm the business development manager for a, um, a company here in Nashua. We're up off of uh, Amherst Street behind the the market basket in the old um, Amphenol building. If any of you are familiar with that uh, manufacturer, they, they did uh, circuit boards. We're in their old space. Our focus mostly is on electronics recycling. Um, if you've taken a TV to the local landfill or your business has recycled its computers or computer monitors, it would come to a company like ours. Um, and then depending on the, the type of device it is, uh, you know, it will go through a certain process and either we dismantle it ourselves within, you know, our operation or we would work with a partner company that specializes in that type of stream. And, and the goal is, is obviously to recover as much reusable commodity and direct that back into the, the recycling stream as possible. But there is waste involved with a lot of this material as well, as you can imagine. Uh, which is why if you'd have recycled a TV in years past, you had to pay for it because of the amount of waste and the, and the glass and the weight that, that has to be managed once that, that TV is, is dismantled. Um, we support you know, groups like uh, the NRA, uh, a lot of businesses, a lot of cities and towns. Uh, we're the state contractor for um, the state of Rhode Island. That's, they have a producer responsibility program where uh, the manufacturers actually contribute to um, pay for the recycling of some of these items that are that uh, you know cost a little bit more. Uh, we also work quite a bit in Massachusetts with a lot of the public agencies. Uh, we're on the Mass Massachusetts statewide contract. We've been a contractor in Connecticut. And we do a lot of work up here in um, New Hampshire as well. Uh, you, you, you probably wouldn't see us face to face uh, at at your home. Uh, you know, we're we're a company that uh, if we're sending out a truck, it's it's a tractor trailer or a, a box truck. We're picking up in bulk. It's it's not like a, a door to door type service. So that'll give you kind of an idea of uh, the world that we're operating in. Good evening. I'm Lisa Drake from Stonyfield Yogurt. And um, hopefully you all know who we are and uh, are familiar with our, our yogurt products. We, uh, our history in New Hampshire was that Stonyfield was founded in 1983 on a farm in Wilton, New Hampshire. And the idea of making yogurt was to help support a nonprofit organization on the farm that was educating people about sustainable agriculture. So they had seven cows and they had a lot of milk and so they started making yogurt and to make some money. So now we are, um, let's see, 37 years later or so, and uh, we're in Londonderry, and we're the um, number four yogurt brand in the country and the number one organic yogurt. So we're distributing our products all across the country. More than 85% of it is made right here in New Hampshire. We have a few places where we contract out for yogurt to be made elsewhere. And, um, you know, we've, we're founded with an environmental ethic that we work hard to stay true to today. We have a mission to support, to make healthy food while supporting healthy people, a healthy planet, and delivering on a healthy business. And so how we interact with this topic of recycling solid waste, of course, we do create waste, and we have uh, had a recycling program in-house for about 30 years now, so I could talk about some aspects of that, but I think the more interesting aspect is that we're very conscious of the fact that we create waste that go into your homes. Um, that the packaging that we use is the way that we get that product 
home to our consumers and get it there in a way that is safe for the food, in a way that gives you the information you need to know about our product and attracts you to buy our product. So there's a lot of considerations that go into packaging, but certainly we're very mindful about the environmental impacts and the waste impacts associated with those choices that we make. And um, so that's just one example of my job in sustainability is how can I help the company operate our, in ways that we're mindful about our impacts and that we are doing the best we can to be sustainable in the long term for the environment and our communities and our supply chain. So that was great. What an excellent panel. Who wants to start? Does anybody have a question for the panel? Um, thank you very much for the panel um, coming in with all this broad level of expertise. Um, my, fir my primary question, I guess, is targeted for Reagan and Mike. With the recent political changes and the shifts in the offshore recycling, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of China, the destination for many of our very toxic recycled items, what percentage do you feel of the, the waste and the recycling that we produce in New England is being turned around in the local areas by some of the companies, and how much of it is going offshore? And are there challenges in that new political economic model? So uh, just to start off, you know, as, as many of you may know, at the beginning of 2018, China stopped importing all unsorted mixed paper, all plastics, and some other materials into their country. Close. Need to get closer? Oh, please. Now, when that happened, China was one of the largest purchasers of recyclable material for the entire world. So just as an example, before this policy, it's called China's National Sword, before this ban was implemented, China purchased over half of the entire world's scrap paper. So that's massive. And so what happens is when your largest buyer stops buying, we had this massive oversupply of material. And so that, in a very simple uh, nutshell, is why we have such a, a reduced value of recyclables across the board right now is primarily tied to China, the world's largest buyer of recyclable material, deciding that they no longer wanted to import certain material. Um, so what that means is that temporarily some material is being thrown away if it can't find a new outlet. We did see, for example, with mixed paper, when I say mixed paper, that is your, your office paper, your junk mail, your newspaper, your magazines, all of those mixed together. When China closed its door to that material, India became the next largest importer of that material. And so there was you know, a new market, a new buyer who was going to take up some of this excess supply. We're actually seeing just in the last month or so that India is tightening its restrictions as well. Um, so we still have this oversupply of material. Now the silver lining is to the extent that material like mixed paper is not already being used as a feedstock for new products in the United States. There's actually 22 new or existing paper mills that are being developed in North America that are going to use cardboard or mixed paper as a feedstock. And so they're going to start taking up some of that excess supply. And you know the predictions we've heard from the vendors that we work with is that we can expect by hopefully the end of 2020, maybe the beginning of 2021, that we're going to see an improvement in the value of that particular recyclable commodity. And the reason I'm talking so much right now about mixed paper and cardboard is when we look at the entire, um, the entire pie of what are the recyclables that we generate as individuals, municipal, you know, municipal solid waste, what are the recyclables we generate, half to more than half of it, maybe half to 65% of it, is cardboard and mixed paper. So we are seeing domestic improvement in, in recycling infrastructure. It takes time for new factories to be built. We're also seeing, for example, a number of new facilities across the country that will be used to recycle plastic. Um, so those things are coming online, and I do think that the silver lining of 
the challenges we're seeing right now with recycling is that we as a country are going to be doing a better job of managing our recyclables. You know, our waste stream is obviously a lot, our waste and recycling stream is obviously a lot different than the, it doesn't have quite the diversity that, that Reagan does. It, it's, um, you know, we're dealing with electronics and circuit boards and heavy metals, but there's, there's smelting operations that have been around for years. The prices have definitely been affected, but as long as there's a market for it, let's say like plastics, for instance, um, as long as there's a market for that product, uh, whether it's, you know, China shuts down and, and um, the, the, there may be another outlet in, in another country and there's a broker that will get the material there. As long as it's, it's, it's a, a vetted and uh, outlet that is willing to recycle and reuse the material, um, those options there. But if those shut down, then the alternative is landfill or hazardous waste landfill, depending on the on the waste product. It's not as complicated, it's just a, it's a matter of economics and it's a matter of are there markets for the materials and is there a waste stream for the material and it's up to us to kind of manage and evaluate which, which way we want to send our product. I'll try to keep it brief. I'm a selectman in Hillsborough and on the Solid Waste Advisory Board. Um, so we've uh, stopped recycling glass a number of years ago because as an NRA member there was no place to bring it. Uh, we stopped uh, recycling plastic. Uh, because the costs were just astronomical and um, the unknowns of where it goes. We, we were trucking it up to um, Red River Junction. Uh, there's no place closer, so that's um, quite a lot of trucking fees. It's three times the cost to um, recycle the plastic than to, uh, to put it in the trash can. Um, so and we, we made the decision, the hard decision, to um, send it to uh, it's Pembroke or Penacook, the uh, incinerator, uh, which is where our trash goes, so at least we know where it's going. Versus the, you know, I'm, I'm told by this lady that none of our plastic has actually been going overseas because it's West Coast stuff, so that's good. But th there is a bill uh, that we started um, in New Hampshire to, to a, co a committee to study the, the feasibility of a regional plastic to oil. Um, Hillsboro is pretty small. Uh, the numbers we've gotten are too big for us, probably, um, but not totally out of the picture. And But as a regional thing, uh, that might work. Um, for this whole plastic to oil thing seems like an interesting idea. So I don't know how many of those are questions and statements and things. What I can say is that Again, it's all very individual to communities, but as a general rule, if you're separating out your material, we have yet to run into an instance where we've been unable to market that material. So um, there are a number of communities near you that are separating out their glass, and they're either sending it to one of our consolidation sites to be um, turned into fiberglass insulation, or they're sending it to a consolidation site where the glass gets crushed and used as an aggregate in road and infrastructure projects. Um, so there are a number of communities in your area that are participating in that program. As far as plastic goes, um, there is a big difference between how you separate out your plastic. So for example, if your community mixes all of its one through seven plastics together and then bales that together and sells that as a commodity, you'll get a lower price for that because again, you're outsourcing it to someone to buy it and separate it for you. But right now, if communities separate out, we have many communities that switched from doing a one through seven mix, and now they just separate out their number one soda bottles, their number two natural milk jugs, and their number two colored, which is you know your detergent bottles. And if you just separate those out, there's quite a bit of value in those material, um, whereas there's not a, as much value in the, the three through seven plastics. So right now, when you look at sort of the, the average, the average um, blended ton, if you look at a ton of recyclables coming out of a municipality, the smallest by weight are your plastics and your aluminum cans and metals. That's where most of the value is right now in terms of financial value. Whereas, as I mentioned, more than half of that pie is mixed paper and cardboard. And you're having to pay to get your mixed paper recycled right now. I just wanted to add a, th a thought. This um, this idea of plastic to oil is is interesting. Um, you know, we've also been watching development of um, chemical recycling um, developing as a technology. So recycling that is generally done today is a physical practice. It's um, you know chopping up materials. Um, in the case of plastics, melting it. Um, and creating new materials from it all in a physical process. And the idea of chemical recycling is that it actually can break down, I don't know if it works for glass, but certainly for plastics, what's developing is um, technologies to break it, 
break those plastics down to the molecular level such that new plastics can be made from it. And so, you know, this is on pilot scale now. It's, it's very R&D. Um, but I think it holds some hope for the future that um, it, it could create much more of a, of a circular, circularity um, in, our, in our society for some of these materials, at least. Also say on the, the plastic, it really kind of depends also, um, on the, the price of oil at the moment as well. If, the, you know, if, if all of a sudden fossil fuel prices go through the roof, you're going to see a lot of entrepreneurs get into the plastics recycling business if they can recover oil from it. So there are other market forces out there other than just how the material sorted, how it's collected. It, it's where is the demand for the material and what drives it? A big part of most municipal waste streams is organics. And Durham, at least, is considering setting up a composting system, which most European towns and cities have. They almost always have an extra bin for compostable materials. Um, Durham estimated a, a quarter of their weight is or is uh, compostable. So, and that's probably not even dealing with some of the things like papers that are at least possibly compostable. So, um, and I know in Vermont and Massachusetts, there's now restrictions on the uh, putting of organic waste from restaurants into landfills, and I guess that is going to probably get stricter so that there will be more material for composting. And there are some companies. Mr. Fox in Maine, and there's City Soil in Boston, who are making you know a business out of composting. Now, recently, that can also be turned into heat energy. Uh, it's a process only about 10 years old. Um, so it's another thing, I guess, for municipalities to think about. It's it's another thing you would be asking your people to do. Um, but one to I kind of put it to the mix because it could m result in a major reduction in the total weight of material. You, you pay by the ton, right? So when it's wet and it's dense, <laughs> so you get that out of there, it uh, weighs a lot less than plastic. Or yeah, also on the food waste front, um, so Vermont has a landfill ban with food waste, as does Massachusetts. And this is changing dynamics quite a bit. And so one of the things, in addition to composting food waste, is digestion. And using anaerobic digestion to uh, create a biogas yeah. that can be used okay. as a fuel, and um, so there's this is there's a few facilities in Massachusetts that have been built over the last few years in order to do that and to create an outlet for the food waste and to have a benefit of essentially creating a renewable energy from it. Hi, I know that communities are between single source and. Um, single stream recycling. I happen to live in Nashua, which is single stream, but I am more than willing to take the effort and the time to drive my recyclables sorted well somewhere else. Are there options for those of us that are willing to do that? Because I know a lot of places you have to be a resident of that town to utilize that recycling service. You're correct that most communities you need to be a resident to bring your material. Um, I know some people, their community has uh, severely curtailed their recycling, for example, and so they take it to a community where they work that is recycling, or maybe they bring it to a friend whose community is recycling. Those are not feasible workarounds for most people. I believe that the city of Lebanon's facility will take recyclables from anywhere, but you're having to drive your recyclables all the way to Lebanon, so you got to take into account that factor as well. I understand that recycling is, is so difficult and we have so much of it, so my question is about the other half of the equation, which is just simply reducing what we have. And I know um, in New Hampshire, for example, supposedly, but I haven't been able to find the details, there's a bill out to just simply help us prohibit plastic bags from being used. And I'm just wondering if there are, you know, I was kind of curious as to what's happening with that and if there are other things that we can do that just simply reduce the amount of trash that we have. Well, I mean, there's certainly many things that individuals, that we as individuals can do to reduce our waste. Uh, if you haven't heard of the, the concept of zero waste, um, there's a lot of information on the internet about people who try to adopt zero waste practices, for example, um, you know, always bringing your stainless steel container with you and never buying a, you know, bottled water, just so you avoid that bottled water. Um, on a broader 
policy level, there is quite a bit of proposed legislation coming out right now uh, that came out of a study committee that held hearings in the fall um, that was referred to earlier. So there was a, it was called HB 617. It was a recycling and solid waste study committee and their job was to look at the challenges that municipalities are facing with managing their recycling programs right now and then make recommendations for how the state can help. And most study committees, they might hold a handful of hearings and issue a report that's a handful of pages. This committee held an unprecedented 14 hearings and they issued a nearly 30 page report. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, if you go to the homepage of our website, it's www.nrra.net. We have links to some of that information on our homepage. Um, and now there are more than a half dozen bills that were directly coming out of the recommendations of that committee. So one of them, for example, is to evaluate the state's solid waste reduction goal. So we actually had a goal set by, set by statute that by the year 2000, we were going to divert 40% of our waste, either through recycling or composting or some other means. We don't know if we ever achieved that goal because the Department of Environmental Services wasn't empowered to collect the data they needed to know if that diversion was happening. So one of the bills coming out of this study committee that just had a hearing recently would be to set a new goal for the state to reduce our waste by 25% by a certain date. And that would be measured simply by taking how much trash was produced in New Hampshire at 2018, starting at that level, and then we're gonna try and reduce it by 25%. And then, of course, the bigger question is, how do you actually achieve that? So there's another bill that came out. And this bill proposes to put a $1.50 surcharge on all waste disposed of in New Hampshire. Because it just so happens that in New Hampshire, half of the waste that's disposed in our state is coming from out of state. And much of that is coming from Massachusetts. Because other states are restricting their landfills, restricting their incinerators, and so more and more waste is coming to us. So this bill would essentially charge $1.50 per ton on all waste disposed of in New Hampshire, and then it would propose to rebate back to municipalities in New Hampshire their $1.50, so they're made whole. And then the remaining funds, which are coming from out-of-state waste, and then also from waste generated by businesses in New Hampshire, or other entities, that money would be used to fund a new technical assistance and education group at the Department of Environmental Services who would be able to assist communities with actually reducing their waste. And then also it would fund a grant program that municipalities and businesses in New Hampshire would have access to for, again, working on reducing their waste, whether it's through recycling or composting or other measures. So I'm really glad I'm here. I'm enjoying this discussion a lot. Now, ironically, I almost didn't get here because I got trapped behind a waste truck, garbage truck, that went off the road on 101 just east of Manchester, and I sat there. Fortunately, I left 45 minutes extra time, so I was here on time. Just thought that was a little bit of irony. But in terms of reducing waste streams, uh, UNH has some interesting examples because the things that are controlled centrally, like the food waste, uh, things from the agricultural farms and stuff. Uh, policies can be set up and processes can be done fairly easily because it's a top-down thing. UNH has not been successful in recycling, um, except in these controlled facilities like the football stadium where everything that comes in is compostable. To get students to recycle, um, you know, it's personal behavior. And there's a very strong environmental ethic on campus, but you need the bins. You know, I say it's bins and behaviors, you know? You need to have the right infrastructure to make it easy and educational to make sure stuff goes in the right bins. You know, and then you're teaching kids. Um, and I think it's probably the same thing in municipalities, you know? Uh, there are certainly financial incentives. Durham is considering pay per throw, which Dover does. Um, lots of heat around that, as you might imagine, but that in some cases has reduced the amount of waste going to landfills, whether or not it's actually going out on the back 40 instead might be a question, um, but the financial incentives or any other thing, because it's really, it's, it's, it is individual behaviors, I think, that are going to help solve that problem, and that's education, that's culture, that's all kinds of things, and maybe financial incentives like paper throw. 
as a manufacturer, you know, we, we know that the most efficient package that we sell is what we call our tubs. You know, it's like a quart of yogurt and two pounds of yogurt in, in one package. So from a, how much packaging do we use per serving of yogurt? That's the most efficient package. So if that's, you're trying to reduce your use of materials and buying the food at the grocery store, thinking bigger packages generally are, are better. But the trend and the, what we struggle with to some degree is um, Americans like convenience. And so there's a lot of demand for smaller packages, especially when it comes to our kids and our baby products. Of course, they're eating less in one serving as it is. Um, but these things that you can take to go are really popular. And so that takes all kinds of different materials and formats and generally are more packaging intensive. Uh, years ago, I realized we had a lot of food waste and I started composting, but it didn't work out. I used it in my garden, but still didn't work out. But recently I heard something else of interest. They said there is a service where you pay a monthly fee, take all your compost, put it in a bucket or some kind of container, and then they will compost it for you. And then the resultant compost that could be used in your garden, you can pick up for free in the summer. Does Nashua have any kind of a arrangement like that or any other facilities? Up our way in, in uh, Durham, there's a, this Mr. Fox that actually had to locate in Maine because the New Hampshire restrictions on food waste being composted were such that it w he couldn't do it in New Hampshire. Uh, it was a really interesting story. A bunch of students got together, went through their legislators, got the bill changed in New Hampshire. So now he actually could move to New Hampshire and, and operate, but, but he, he's already in Maine. But I saw his truck go through the neighborhood just this morning. Um, and he was picking up compost from various places. Sounds like the same kind of process, and I suppose we'll be re returning probably about 40% of that weight back <laughs> as compost because the rest of it disappears. Bit of a sad story, which is that in 2015, these UNH students did succeed in having a bill passed in New Hampshire that directed the Department of Environmental Services to update their composting regulations. They haven't been able to do that yet because the department is so severely understaffed and under-resourced. So they've, they've held stakeholder group meetings. They've worked on, I think, drafts of updating their composting regulations, but it actually hasn't happened. And one of the proposed bills coming out of the study committee from the fall is to direct the Department of Environmental Services that by a certain date they must update the composting regulations. And, and it's not that you can't, it, the issue is with meat and dairy. So the way the regulations are in New Hampshire, if you want to compost meat or dairy, either at a commercial or municipal level, you need to have a certain type of permit that requires a very extensive review and approval process through the Department of Environmental Services. So right now I think we have only six uh, companies or entities in New Hampshire that are permitted to compost food waste and only one of them is allowed to compost meat and dairy. And that's Star Island, because they got a special exception because they didn't want to have to take all their waste off site. Um, but hopefully that legislation, or hopefully those regulations will get updated soon so that it is more accessible for communities that have not that super extensive permit, um, but a different version, a different solid waste permit that they could more easily compost meat and dairy with appropriate guidance. They had a code that the students, one of my graduate students was one of the people involved in that, and they sold it to the legislator and the legislature as reducing uh, inhibitions on, on enterprise, that there were too many regulations in place, and it was freeing up um, you know, innovative entrepreneurs to be able to do this new thing in New Hampshire, which I thought was very savvy of them. Quick question for Mike. Uh, if we're a nonprofit, uh, are we able to try to collect or have monthly or quarterly like electronics people to drop off? Is there problems with privacy getting you the, the, the items? Uh, are there some different ways we can try to channel, maybe raise a little bit of money on the side uh, as a nonprofit, but just to try to get you some things to work on over there? Sure. So um, in that case, what we would do, we, we work with uh, groups that uh, would do like a recycling drive. So let's say you, you know, we would partner with a group and they set up in a high school or a church or a parking lot and then promote the event. And we would provide the, you know, the, the trucks and the supplies to collect the material and then work out a, an arrangement with you that 
um, we basically like giving you a wholesale rate on the on the on the processing and collection of the material and then you can work with your you know your customers and 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 uh, try and raise some money um, but yeah come speak to me and we can uh, discuss how how that works but that is definitely a possibility good evening everybody Thank you, Science Cafe, for having me. My name is Stephanie O'Bear, and I am the Director of Program Development for Grow Nashua. So let me tell you a little story about waste, food waste. So Grow Nashua has several programs. We've got our Growing Spaces program. We are going to build our sixth and seventh community garden this year, 2020. We have a growing education program and that serves the elementary schools in Nashua. We teach about growing food and we have gardens at several of those schools. We also have a curbside compost program. Began about a year and a half ago in my, uh, in Grow Nashua's executive director's backyard. He decided it would be a really neat fundraiser to A, be able to hire a local um, fellow and provide a, a fair wage job, but also to collect food waste from residents in Nashua and compost in his backyard. And so that was a success. But what he found was he didn't have enough space and he actually didn't have enough carbon to break down the compost. He was getting a lot of the nitrogen, the food waste, and it was uh, causing uh, uh, a mess in his backyard. So then we we're able to team up with Whole Cycle. It's a, an industrial or, or commercial scale <coughs> compost facility in, Mass or in Maine. And so we're able to send our food waste that we collected in Nashua up there to compost, uh, to go through the compost process and then collect some, some of the uh, byproduct to f give back to our clients. Well, what we found out, so Whole Cycle teamed up with AgriCycle AgriCycle is a company, I believe, in Massachusetts. And recently, we renamed our program from food waste recycling or food waste pickup to curbside compost just in time for us to find out that our food waste is actually going to a biodigester or an anaerobic digestion facility, which is great news for climate change uh, mitigation. It's a wonderful system. Uh, it's a really, it's a really neat um, program, but we branded our program as compo curbside compost. The cool thing about AgriCycle is they, with their um, biodigestion program, they got a state-of-the-art depackaging machine that is able to um, depackage things like, you know, your salad mix or, or, or things that come in packaging. And so we're able to appeal to some larger clients, um, the soup kitchen, schools, faith-based organizations, um, restaurants, who don't have time to empty their, their rotten salad bags out. And we're able to offer that service and continue working with AgriCycle, but then also have our, our compost program um, with Mr. Fox. So that's kind of all I have for you. I want to ask, what is the right recipe for starting compost? Uh, how can the homeowner, uh, what can we do, right? How can we get started? Well, you buy a carbon nitrogen analyzer. No. <laughs> no, but what the comment about too much nitrogen in the food is a real one. Um, you need the right balance of carbon and nitrogen. So good carbon sources would be paper, cardboard, um, wood chips, whatever. At the organic dairy, uh, we take the stuff out of the barn, which has been, um, we used wood shavings as bedding material. So it's probably two thirds wood shavings, one third manure. Works really well. Um, at the equine facilities, they use hay, uh, and that stuff really cooks. In fact, once it got too hot, we had to cool it down because it was going to catch fire. It's got up to 170 degrees. Um, so and the <laughs> student who was managing it was out of town. Fortunately, his parents were watching the pile for us. Um, uh, so yeah, you need the right amount of carbon nitrogen. So food waste by itself probably needs grass clippings or leaves or something like that. It sounds like we've got some experience here in the front row. But yes, you do need, uh, if, you, if you just do food waste, which I've been doing for years in one of those big black bins, it disappears completely. 
um, because there's no fiber in it, or very little fiber in most of it. You need fiber to form the organic matter, to form the humus. So you need leaves, you need grass clippings, although grass is pretty high in nitrogen as well. You, yes, you have to have oxygen, um, so, um, which is why people turn their windrow piles. And I'm going to put in a plug here. If you really want to think about getting energy out of compost, and I know the digesters have had kind of a checkered history, um, aerated static pile composting. That's all I'm going to say. You can look it up. Uh, it's a pretty nifty way of getting heat energy out of this if you have the right mix. There's a, a heifer farm up in Vermont. Ooh. All right, there's a heifer farm up in Vermont, which was the first one to do this about 10 years ago, working with AgriLab Technologies. Um, they get $10,000 a year worth of heat out of their waste um, through this method. So it's a fun thing to, to look at. And UNH has the only research facility that does that, so it's kind of cool. Um, but yes, you need, the right, you need the right moisture content, you need oxygen, you need the right balance of carbon and nitrogen. You know, I mean, something like 20, 25 to 1 on those. And you can look up how much carbon and nitrogen there is in different sources and mix it. You can get really specialized on this, too. I mean, but yes, you need all of those components in the right mixture. Okay. Is that a good enough answer? How long does it take? Whoa. So if you're a commercial composter, like Mr. Fox, or like City Soil Boston, they will turn a pile around in 21 days. Now they can do that, and we can do that at the place at uh, the Organic Dairy, because it gets to 150 degrees and it stays there for three weeks. So you lose about 30% of the weight, 40% of the weight, in that three week period. Now if you want to maximize energy from it, you might keep it longer, but these places, you know, they have a capacity issue and they want to get as much stuff through as they possibly can. So 20, as I understand it, three to four weeks is the standard retention time. And then they'll offload it from this aerated system and it'll cure, you know, separately, I guess, for several months. And then it sometimes has to be screened in order to, you know, be saleable compost. But it's very, uh, it's pretty high cost, high value product when it's done. Sell it to gardeners and landscapers. Can any of you speak to uh, the textile waste that we have and recycling of that? We've done composting for a number of years. I've gotten to the point where I, I actually uh, take care, help take care of a property in another state where I bring some of the yard waste, more the weeds that I don't ever want to see again, or invasive species to the the dump where they recycle, because I don't want that in my compost um, at all that I want would reuse. And that goes for the same um, for my own yard. I, I've got invasive species I just don't want. I bag it up. I take it to the stump dump. Somebody else can deal with it. However, I, I feel bad for those people who take that compost <laughs> and might have at the dump and use it in their yard and maybe they might have an invasive species that they might not want. Uh, the commercial composters with the large piles and the high temperatures will kill most of those things. They'll kill the seeds, they'll kill the bacteria, they kill. That's why in order to actually use compost on an agricultural situation or in a garden, it has to go, I think, above 130 degrees for three consecutive days or something because that effectively sterilizes the material. Backyard compost piles will never get that way. And my wife is a master gardener person, and she says, see that fungus on that? That's going to the dump. You know, We don't want that in the compost pile. So in Durham, they burn that stuff. On, our, on the textiles question, do you Sorry. have any... any? Anything? So I just have an anecdote. I don't have a great answer, but I have an anecdote. Well, so I just on the, res the the textiles thing. I I don't think that there's great textile recycling going on in the world. But correct me if anyone if I'm wrong. But um, you know, I did uh, get the opportunity to visit a facility owned by the Eileen Fisher Company, and um, this is really interesting. If you you know, Eileen Fisher is is fairly high end fashion. Um, but they, if you, when you buy Eileen Fisher products, it's designed to last nearly forever. Um, it's designed to be timeless, I guess is the better way to say it, um, stylistically and quality-wise. Um, but if you are done with your Eileen Fisher clothing, you can send it back to their facility, and they take it all in wherever it comes from, 
and they go through it. And if it's something that's still usable, they have reselling stores where you're buying secondhand Eileen Fisher clothing. They, you know, of course, clean it and refurbish it and sew buttons back on and things like that if needed. If it's not well good enough to resell, then they have all these other things they start to do with it. And so they have um, designed styles where they have some very basic items that keep coming back. Um, they sell a lot of these like basic black pants. And so if they receive some that has a hole in it, they're not going to resell it, but they take pieces of the fabric, they cut it out, and they start making new items out of it and then sell those um, as a unique piece. And then finally, if the fibers are completely not usable for, new, for, for, for clothing, then they have um, invested in some machinery that essentially weaves fibers back together to make um, these kind of really neat, um, intricate designs from all sorts of different fibers and different colors and whatnot, and then they're making um, like pillows, pillow covers, and things like that for that they sell for your home. And these also are very expensive at the end of the day. So this is not a cost-saving, you know, a cost, a money-making venture for them, but it is. A, it's a very interesting experiment. Experiment about what you what you can do with fibers. I have a question and an observation and a comment. About 35 years ago. Some of my business colleagues were working on something called waste to energy. This was after the big run up in oil prices. And um, we eventually gave up on it because it seemed to become not as viable. I have a feeling there is a waste to energy and we don't like to talk about it because it doesn't sound as good. So I like your comment about that. The other comment I'd like to make is what drives me crazy are all these people running around telling me I can't have a plastic bottle for water. Um, frankly, that's the easiest recycling thing on the planet, and I'll quote from this same business, according to this guy that I talked to a little while ago, they process seven million soda and water bottles a day and cover all of the Northeast. So can we little talk about that, that that's okay, that is recycled? Do we have to have paper water containers? Well, as I mentioned earlier, when you look at the most financial value in our residential recycling right now. It is in those number one and number two plastics. Your soda bottles are the number one, Pete's. You've got your number two milk jugs and your uh, number two colored sort of detergent bottles and such. Um, there is a strong market for each of those. It's some of the remaining plastics that don't have as much of a strong market. There is actually a good market for number five plastics um, but not as much, we don't see as much of that getting recycled in New Hampshire, for example, if you're source separating. But if your single stream recycling is getting exported out of state, which it is, um, they very well be maybe good markets for the number five plastics. But at least if you're seeing, talking about rural communities that source separate, number one and two plastics have very good value. And interestingly, you may have heard that a number of big conglomerate companies have been putting out goals that they would like to achieve a certain amount of recycled content in their plastic packaging by certain years. And there was a very interesting study that was done by, I believe it was by the Recycling Partnership, where they looked at the available supply of plastic that is currently being recycled versus the amount of plastic that would need to be recycled for all those companies to meet their goals. And there's a huge gap. There's a huge gap because even though your soda bottle, your water bottle in plastic is highly recyclable, a lot of it still is thrown away. So we actually need to dramatically improve the recycling rates for those number one and two plastics in order for these companies to even be able to achieve their stated goals. So there's quite a, a big push across the country to include, to improve curbside single stream recycling so that those companies can actually get the feedstock they need to increase their recycled content in their material. Just to pick up on that a little bit, one of the, so some of the companies that we have worked with in the past, some of the, the waste management and recycling companies, a lot of what you're talking about, like the bottles and even the plastic bags, um, like I know part of the, the plastic bag ban was because these bags, once they go into like a single sort, facility they get wrapped around the screens okay and then then you have to shut down the operation to clean out the screens because you're not recycling any, 
any of the other materials. So it's a contaminant into the waste stream. Even if it's, even if it's recyclable, it's the operational challenges that come along with some of these products. And, and I think the, the, the water bottles, what kind of was the, uh, I, I don't know, know this for sure, but part of the genesis of the, the banning the water bottles, I, I, I live in Woburn, Mass, and I know Concord, Mass was one of the, the first towns to do this. And, um, and if I remember correctly, a lot of the, 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 the press about it was, uh, you know, the water bottles at the, at the river's edge and, and uh, more about the pollution impact of, of these water bottles everywhere and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the visual of it. So um, there, there are other factors as, as, you know, to go along with just are there markets available, how difficult is it to, to recycle the material and collect and, and process? Recycling is important and it's good. And yet if you can avoid using that water bottle altogether, you know, back to the zero waste idea, you know, then that's better because there is energy used in making that recycling happen. And, you know, because it needs to be transported and, you know, it, it came from fossil fuel to begin with, and then it, you know it had to be manufactured, and that took energy, and it needed to be transported, and that took energy, and then it goes to your, you know, goes wherever it travels in its life, and it takes energy to recycle it. So all of those things do have impact. So where you can avoid rather than recycle, you know, that is better. That's like sort of the hierarchy, right? Of reduce, reuse, recycle. And then the other thing that you're getting, you you, you started to allude to is plastic versus like some other alternative container for your water. And I just wanted to just mention that because, um, you know, we really think about life cycle of packaging and impacts like through all those steps that I was just kind of just describing with a water bottle. Um, you really have to think about all those things because recycling issues are really important. They certainly have impacts on communities. Um, but when we think about what is the impact of our packaging, we do think all the way back to where did this material come from? Did it come from petroleum products? What are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with taking that fossil fuel out of the ground? And then what are the greenhouse gas emissions with all those steps in between? And that all in all, the, the best decision we can make is to use the least amount of material to be thinking about it in greenhouse gases because the end of life of our package is only about 3% of its overall impact in its life. So that's why we make a product in this plant-based plastic that can't be recycled and generally can't be composted unless you go to an industrial composting facility. But we still felt it was a good improvement because it's not using those fossil fuels to begin with and has roughly half of the overall impact on greenhouse gases. So it's complicated. <laughs> Hi, I've been reading a lot lately about microplastics in the ocean, and my, and my question to the panel is what kinds of things can we do to help mitigate uh, the, the plastics that are going into the ocean, and in particular, are there certain kinds of uh, plastics that we could avoid using uh, that would not lead to the microplastic uh, accumulation in the oceans? And one of the things I, th I think we're learning about microplastics in the ocean is that one of the sources is our laundry and what materials are we washing and the fibers that are released every time you wash um, so like um, polyesters can be coming out of your washing machine going out to Merrimack River and out to the Atlantic Ocean um, so you know natural fibers over synthetic fibers may be part of that solution. In terms of plastics on packaged food, for example, I have, I, I, what happens to it? Like if I, 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 I put them in the grocery store plastic recycling thing, but I, I don't know what happens to it. Does it go anywhere or is it just going to the rental? And do you have any ideas on how to get rid of that? Like others, most other things, I, I think I've figured out some ways, but I minimize the packaged foods I buy but still there is some plastic in packaged foods or things I buy, like I bought a computer cable today, it comes in a plastic bag. So you're referring to plastic film that right. you can take to the back to the grocery store, like your like they, a plastic bag or? Right, they seem to collect it if I give it to them, but mm -hmm. I don't know what they do afterwards. Right, so, so plastic film, like your plastic grocery bags, the plastic bags that your bread comes in, those are recyclable 
typically not through your local recycling facility because they, especially if they're sending the material to a materials recovery facility, they really don't want that gumming up the machinery. That's the number one contaminant is plastic bags, basically, um, which is both time consuming and dangerous for workers to go and cut bags out of the machinery. Um, but you can take it to a lot of major retail stores, like grocery stores, and what actually they do, much of that material is used for Trex decking. Trex decking is a composite. It, it's made to sort of look like wood, but it's a wood and plastic composite okay. decking that's very durable. So that plastic film is a major component of Trex decking. So I know that a number of the retail stores in New Hampshire are sending their material uh, to be recycled through Trex. I know earlier you guys were talking about reduce, reuse, recycle, which we've been learning in schools for years and years and years. And I hope that the elementary and middle and high schools are starting to add the refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and teach that as a hierarchy. Those three are not equal, or those four are not equal. You should refuse first, then reduce, then re uh, reuse, then recycle. And can I add rot to the end? So five R's. Uh, actually, that's a nice segue. I'll just mention that our, our, we do a two-day annual conference each year. And this year, our keynote speaker is Bea Johnson. She is the leading spokesperson on the zero waste lifestyle movement. She travels the world speaking about the five R's, starting with refuse and ending with rot. And we should be teaching them. But you know, I'll tell you, this, genera this, this generation that's in school right now, they're different. And they already know it somehow and they're changing their lifestyles in ways that, as older folks, is harder for us to do, perhaps. All right, please join me in thanking this exceptional panel. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Next month, we'll be talking about the science of science fiction, so put it on your calendar. See you then. <laughs>